There is potentially a very serious financial and banking crisis unfolding before our eyes, and we may be heading into a very serious recession. So how exactly should we invest and position ourselves as investors? This is the theme of our discussion with James from Invest Answers. He has the answers for us, and he has been running a very large YouTube channel called Invest Answers, dedicated to educating the public about finance and investments. James has a finance background and has worked in finance for several decades before starting his YouTube channel. A pleasure to host you today, James. Welcome to my show. Thank you so much, David Lim. Big fan of yours, watching you from a long time. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, let's talk about the big theme stuff first. You told me offline, get ready for change. The next 8 to 12 years will be a significant change in our world. What exactly are you talking about? What changes will we see? Well, there's, there's so much happening. There's so many S-curves colliding across um, AI and compute and energy and electrification of the world. And then on the other side of the fence, you have a world built on a house of debt that is just exploding. There's no getting back to proper debt to GDP levels in most places around the world. And deficits are going to explode. There simply isn't enough tax base to follow. And that means a lot of money printing. So the old, uh, what I like to refer to as QE to infinity, that you'll see a lot. Um, and part of What's happening now is actually related to that. You know, uh, some people refer to it as QC, <laughs> quantitative confusing, uh, uh, because nobody really knows where to go. You've got the Fed potentially raising interest rates tomorrow and at the same time doing a lot of quantitative easing. And that is a recipe for disaster. And I've been calling for the last five months that uh, something was going to break in the system with the way the Fed was behaving. They were way too late to hike in the first place. Now they're way too late to pivot and uh, everything's breaking and there will be more shoes to drop. Uh, my biggest concern and has been for a long time is an economy is a function of how much liquidity there is in the system. And with this recent banking crisis, although there wasn't a large number of banks hitting the wall, the problem is the existing banks that are left are really going to tighten their lending standards, and that's going to put a huge chokehold on the economy. That's what the Fed should be very concerned about. And then all the other industries that are going to get smashed as a result of the hikes we've had. So it sounds like doom and gloom, but there's ways of positioning yourself to protect yourself, I believe. Yeah. Today's episode is all about investing in this environment and investment implications of what you just said. There's a lot of facets that I want to uncover based on what you've just talked about. Let's talk about the Fed first. Uh, a lot of notable investors, Bill Ackman, for example, have recently come out on media saying that the Federal Reserve doesn't need to raise interest rates this week and that the banking crisis that we've seen um, unfold over the last really couple of weeks culminating in Credit Suisse being bought out this week by UBS, that crisis has already put a dampening on the liquidity in our system. And so it's already acting as quantitative tightening. Do you agree? Uh, yes, I, I do. But uh, more importantly is the kind of QE behind the scenes. But again, hiking and doing QE at the same time is kind of ridiculous. And I think it's much more about kind of the Fed saving face if they do hike. They know, you know, with 320 PhDs on staff, they know it's a mistake. But 25 basis points isn't a lot, consider how far they've hiked so far. Um, they talk a thing about things like being data dependent. And I think that's a severe problem because if they were truly data dependent, they'd see the damage five months ago for exactly what's happened. The problem is the data is six months old and the data is incorrect. Um, so, yeah, we, we're going to face an interesting time. I think what they're probably going to do based on saving face, they will hike 25 basis points. And then next the next shoe that drops, they'll cut pretty rapidly. And the bond market has spoken to that as well. If you look at the two-year bond, it's screaming right now at everybody saying, you know, the Fed funds rate should be below 350 basis points. What does this all mean for, let's focus on stocks first, the equity markets. Now, in the past, if you look at previous Fed tightening cycles, not all rate hike cycles have led to a collapse in the market or even a bear market, for example. What about this time, James? Yeah, it's interesting. I've actually studied that over the past 50 years, exactly what happens post-pivot. But you have to look at the run-up pre-pivot to understand what's going to happen post-pivot. Um, 
I actually, I wish I could share a chart with you, but if you look at the four major pivots over the last, say, 40, 50 years, um, half of them, two of them, had a huge run up, you know, the dot com crisis and global financial crisis. And then two of them actually pivoted while the stock market was actually down. And we are in one of those latter two sections right now. I believe because the market was so beaten up last year because of everything that happened between war, supply chain, inflation surprises, Fed hikes, et cetera, you know, the S&P 500 down just under that 4,000 level, technically lost a year because I also believe in the fact that actual money debases by about 14% on average which Councilor Seyfedin Amus, who has studied this, as fiat currencies all over the world, debased by 14%. So if the stock market is not going up by 14% per year, it's losing money. And at least the stock market historically holds tight with that monetary debasement. So if you imagine last year being a lost year, that means this year has to be a very positive year. That's the way I kind of look at things because there's been so much loss in purchasing power. So sorry if I went off on a bit of a tangent there, but I think this pivot will not be the same as the ones that many remember. That is, once they pivot, it forebodes a recession, which is true. We are getting a recession, but also at the same time, the stock market sniffed it out. It expects the recession. Recession is priced in. And I believe once they pivot, market will go risk on and there's four trillion cash on the sidelines that we should inflate risk on assets very heavily for 2023. Let's talk about the banking crisis, quote unquote crisis that we've seen. Stocks are reacting quite positively today on Tuesday, March 21st to Janet Yellen, Secretary of the Treasury uh, Yellen's statement on Tuesday that the government could step in and rescue the banks if necessary. And uh, I'm just going to read a quote from what she said. The steps we took were not focused on aiding specific banks or classes of banks. Our intervention was necessary to protect the broader U.S. banking system. And similar actions could be warranted if smaller institutions suffer deposit runs that pose the risk of contagion. So basically, the government has pledged to bail out more banks if another SVB were to happen. Um, what do you make of this statement? Do you think the banking crisis is over because the government's going to save everybody? Yeah, um, well, so quite a bit to unpack there. First of all, um, I think Janet Yellen and the Fed and President Biden, they're all trying to bring calmness to the markets. So they're talking things down. There was talk of covering the HTM risk for the next year and then raising it to two years and cover all deposits beyond 250,000 as well. And when you look at that, that's putting in an extra maybe two trillion into the system. But the real problem is after what happened, you know, you've got your small and medium banks and your regional banks that have, you know, high deposits, high level of deposits. People had a tremendous shock over the last nine days after SVB went down and then debacle with First Republic, people are looking very carefully now at safe harbors for large amounts of cash. And I believe that's going to funnel everything into the big four money center banks, the JP Morgans of the world. And that's bad because the US economy relies on these regional banks, these community banks, these small banks to grease the wheels of commerce, to be able to borrow money and build businesses. And if everything goes to the big four, their lending standards are very onerous, and it's very difficult to pull money from them. So I think there's going to be a big long-term problem here, despite the kind, positive words from the Janet Yellens of the world. I think liquidity will dry up. Uh, it'll be very difficult for small businesses to raise money to fund their businesses. Uh, and that's on top of already having very high interest rates. You have a lot of big corporations uh, with the top four money center banks that just got their lending deals canceled over the last 24 hours. Uh, so again, that is my, as I started off, my biggest concern. I think Janet Yellen can say all she wants. I don't think people really listen anymore. I think people understand there's a huge endemic problem within the system today. Are you saying that it's uh, it's more difficult to apply and receive a loan as a small business with a large bank than a regional bank? Yes, and I've been there myself. I've worked with you know the top four. I have an account with I have two accounts with two of the top two, but I do all my banking with a regional bank because I have much more flexibility to dictate terms. Uh, borrow money, 
create things like exotic mortgages uh, for real estate and stuff like that. You don't get that type of flexibility with the big, big shops unless you have more than $100 million deposited with them. Um, and that's a real problem. You, you can't imagine you're a small business in the Midwest. You can't knock on the door at JP Morgan and say, hey, can I borrow a million dollars? You'll, you'll just be too small to get their attention. You'll have somebody at some counter that won't know you from Adam, as they say. And that's the problem. That could be a problem. The other problem, though, the, the, the flip side is that your regional bank has a higher chance of collapse, right? So some might argue that a concentration of, of banking could be safer for everybody. How do you, how do you explore <laughs> yeah. this topic? Yeah. yeah. No, I believe in competition and free markets. Uh, having the money center banks that do reverse repos on behalf of the government controlling everything is not good for commerce in general. I, I do wonder if the UBS and um, Credit Suisse merger broke any antitrust laws in Switzerland. Supposedly not because the Swiss government and the Swiss National Bank are supportive of this and actually helped to orchestrate this deal and have actually contributed money and capital to, to make this happen. But you're, you're right. I mean, you would want more competition in a free market society, especially when it comes to banking. If everybody colludes to raise interest rates and keep them at a certain level, I mean, it's bad for everybody. Well, it's not bad for the banks. It's bad for the consumers. Exactly. In fact, talking about Credit Suisse and UBS, I mean, I think Credit Suisse is around for 160 years. And for them to hit the wall like that is shocking. Second of all, I read this morning that I think the backstop of 100 billion from the Swiss National Bank, that's going to have to be paid for by each taxpayer in Switzerland to the tune of about $14,000 or Swiss francs. I think they're pretty much parity now, but that is stunning. And when people uh, get up from public officials in the US and say, this will not affect the US taxpayer, <laughs> just look at what happened in Switzerland. At the end of the day, it's the retail individual holding the bag, as it were, you know, money printing, et cetera. They're going to be hit one way or another, either with massive exploding deficits, huge national debt, uh, debasement of the currency. It's a perfect cocktail. At the end of the day, the individual is left with the problem. It's very interesting. If you look at Google Trends, uh, if you focus in on the US, the word contagion has spiked up and it's projected to continue spiking up. Everyone's talking about a possible contagion event. It's the biggest word in media right now and probably will be for the next couple of weeks. Basically, what people want to know is, is this a repeat of 2008? Is SVB just a smaller Lehman? Yeah, it's different. Um, and I, I've been thinking a lot about this over the past 10 days. Uh, you know, the GFC was a function of no lending standards that exploded the real estate market. This time, it's all about asset liability mismatch because of long-term bonds. And that's kind of upsetting the balance sheets. And now, for the first time ever, people are going to start really understanding what fractional banking is all about. And there's memes flying around Twitter, et cetera, with somebody handing somebody 20 bucks and the other person handing person 10 bucks and back. And now people understand exactly how these banks operate. Now, I can't remember some of the statistics, but if you look at the amount left in FDIC, the insurance fund for depositors is about $138 billion versus 7.2 trillion in deposits. I mean, what is that fund going to do at the end of the day? And the answer is, yeah, there will be more runs on banks. The people and lending agencies are going to start looking into the asset liability mismatches, the HTM exposure that they have, et cetera. And again, the more the Fed jack rates, the more cracks will appear in the system. That, that That's the whole irony of all of this and how we started the conversation. It's it just every every little bit. I did a video a while back of how the Fed is shooting a can of cannon, cannonballs into a ship. You know, they start with one and two and three and the ship begins to sink. And now just the bow is sticking out of the water and they're about to shoot it with one more cannonball. Then we'll see the real problem. And remember as well, the lag effect of interest rates, it takes six months for something to come to the system. So if they hike 25 basis points tomorrow, we will not see the damage of that until what, September? Wait, one more cannonball? What are you talking about, James? <laughs> Which cannonball are you referring to? So each each Fed hike is like a cannonball that sinks oh, the see. ship. If you imagine the economy being the ship, um, each cannonball is... Uh, <laughs> so they've got one <laughs> more left? Is that what you one think? One more left. Just, I, I, per my opinion, so I've been saying for a long time, if they go above like 375 basis points, 
uh, we'll start seeing what I call financial Armageddon. And here we are. So we are now at at the level of what, 475? So we've gone 100, 125 basis points beyond what the system can handle. Um, and the reason kind of I know this is back in the very early 90s in Switzerland, coincidentally, I used to build um, risk-based capital allocation models. <laughs> that was kind of my job for a while to understand the actual risk profile of financial institutions, to understand which ones generate the most ROI versus which ones have the most risk. So uh, it, it's pretty plain to see for somebody like me of the type of problems that exist in the system. Okay, well, let's let's go further. So what, what are the problems of being, how do you evaluate whether or not we're 100 basis points above equilibrium, for example, or the neutral rate, whatever the, the, you know, the neutral rate is a kind of a fuzzy academic concept. But if you're saying that we're 100 basis points above what the system can handle, how did you arrive at that conclusion? Yeah, so if you imagine a balance sheet, say it's a billion dollars, there's wiggle room for about 10% of that capital to take a hit. Now, once you go beyond a level of, imagine the 10% risk, the asset liability mismatch being about $100 billion of that uh, trillion dollars of capital or $100 million of a billion dollars of capital, just say 10%. Uh, once you go beyond that, you start invoking a lot of stress in the system that cannot be financially contained with the margins, the buffers they have within their balance sheet. And that's exactly what we're seeing right now. Uh, and if you, you there was somebody did a great uh, research article and identified another 186 banks that have the same risk profile as SVB, First Republic. And again, there's more shoes to drop. And those that can run these numbers and look at some balance sheet elements and identify exactly what their bond portfolio looks like, it's pretty easy to decipher which ones are going to face a run and be shorted and not make it and just be acquired by probably a consortium of the big four. And that's the big problem that we're seeing right now. It is different to the global financial crisis, but at the same time, you know what stuns me, it's the year 2023. We have all the information in the world. We have all the regulation in the world, all the regulators in the world. Nobody saw this coming. And that is what surprised me. And that makes me think maybe tinfoil hat on, maybe the game is rigged and they're trying to take down the smaller banks so the larger banks can assume all the power. Mm. Well, we haven't, yeah, it's interesting to see that develop. I don't think we've seen direct evidence of that yet, but it is interesting because Credit Suisse is a very well capitalized bank. And I think people need to understand it's not, it's not just, you don't need to have a failing bank. Well, you don't need to have a bank with inadequate uh, reserves on their balance sheet for it to collapse. A well-capitalized bank like Credit Suisse could also suffer the same fate. Not that they collapsed, but you know they yeah. got bought out at a very. Yeah. I think it was an eighty percent discount to their Friday's close in their market cap. Cap three point two billion dollars was a eighty percent discount to what they were trading just a week prior. So yeah, yeah. a little bit embarrassing uh, for well, I, I think, I think, a bank of that I history. Think, yeah. Yeah, the easy way to think about how the banks are operated is they are just baskets of risk. So you've got your lending risk and your mortgage risk and your credit risk, et cetera, et cetera. And then on top of that basket, you've got leverage. <laughs> so, And they're fractional. And that's the whole problem. It doesn't take a lot to take a bank down. You could have all the capital in the world. It's just any type of mismatch or any type of lending crisis. And that takes you to the next one when you talk about banks is... Um, you know, real estate market is smashed because of the Fed hikes. And, and once we're going to see, we're going to start seeing delinquencies on mortgages, on credit cards, on car loans, that is coming and that's going to hit hard. And the banks that, uh, because of the increase in rates and the fact that people are living, I think 60% or 65% of Americans, for example, are living paycheck to paycheck. And all of a sudden, their car payment has gone from five hundred dollars to a thousand dollars a month, or their mortgage has doubled, or whatever else they were on a fixed rate mortgage now is flipping to variable. I know many people in that situation, and they are facing extreme problems. And then I you compound it with the layoffs that are happening and starting with technology first. I think Amazon had eighteen thousand people; they just announced another ten thousand. Meta ten thousand announced another ten thousand. These are all hitting the technology industry is is moving first. But all other industries are hitting too. And we've got this perfect storm of a huge increase in costs for borrowing. You've got layoffs. 
You've got people living paycheck to paycheck. And then uh, you, you have AI sprinkled on top, which is making companies more effective, more efficient, where they can do the job of three people with now with one person. So it really is a, a crazy situation. And the big, the biggest joke of all that I find, and I feel we're getting a bit political here, and I apologize for that, but um, the biggest joke is how the BLS counts jobs. I think there are 10 million people in the United States that have two or more jobs. And they see them as individuals, not one person. So if you have, say, 10 million people with three jobs, they count that as 30 million jobs. When really, it's only 10 million people with lots of part-time jobs that are very low paying. So, That's so another huge the problem. Unemployment rate is underinflated totally. or underreported. And yeah, and that's another perfect cocktail. Structural changes in the labor market where people have gone through the great resignation, quiet quitting. You have uh, millennials that would rather, you know, check out of the system altogether. They can't get a job that they like or believe pays enough. Uh, it's just so many problems within the actual system itself. Then you've got the gig economy. You got people that can just drive an Uber a few hours a week, and that's enough to make ends meet. So you got a lot of weird things that I don't think the Fed, etc., really understand. Um, but anyway, it's just stuff I see from data. I could Back be completely wrong. Well, yeah, I mean, look, not that I'm saying you're wrong, but I, I, I hope some of these things don't happen. You know, it'll be, it'll be a shame if most of America can't pay their car bills or their rents. Um, that would be disastrous. Uh, people you know, were talking mark, mark about. Mark my words. Come, come back to me at the end of this year, and let's look at some statistics. I guarantee you there'll be an explosion in delinquencies all across I, the board. I want to, I want to present to you some FUD cases for you to evaluate. But first, I have one more question just to follow up. Uh, you know, in 2008, there was a clear, well, not clear, but there was a, there was an understanding of why the banks collapsed. We, we know that the mortgage-backed securities, which were a very complicated product, were packaged in such a way that over-levered the system. And so when the housing market fell, uh, the entire domino effect took place. And Lehman Brothers, Bear Stearns, a lot of banks collapsed. A lot of banks got bailed out uh, as a result. What is the financial product or the, or the stem of the problem we're seeing today? It's not housing. No, it's, it's <laughs> what, what do they say? Um, cheap, cheap money or free money is expensive money. I think that's a very old expression. And for, for the last 15 years, obviously, we've been operating in a next to near zero interest rate environment. In fact, in Europe, it was negative. And that was a head scratch for me. I remember watching for years and saying, how can people deposit money in a bank? And then the bank takes, you know, half of a percent away from the, per it, it just, it, it just boggled my mind and it was accepted by people, which is stunning. So for the last 15 years, very, very low rates. Uh, most, uh, you know, it, it, financial institutions have exploded their debt. They've been reducing the amount of collateral that is required for that debt. And then the cocktail is these rapidly rising rates that have just shot up at a historical pace that nobody ever expected. And this has exposed the losses hidden in the system today. Again, it's all about, I think, it was going to happen sooner or later, like the debt has the cards, somebody has to pay the piper at one stage, but it's the pace of rate hikes without waiting for the financial Armageddon to happen, because again, it takes six months for each hike to get through the system. That is what is exposing all of the cracks in the fractional reserve banking system. So can you make the statement, I know this is a very black and white statement, but can you make the statement that the last great financial crisis was caused by the private sector, whereas this crisis that we're seeing unfolding is caused by the government? And I'd say the last financial crisis was triggered by leverage upon leverage upon leverage on mortgage-backed securities, which were fueled by very loose lending. That's what triggered the last one. This one is triggered by even more debt at a very low rate that suddenly went very high. So, well, that Fed, sounds yes. like that sounds like we're pulling the slingshot back on an even bigger crisis, James. Potentially, yes. Well, we're we're seeing it happen. You know, the the size of the the number of bank failures, I should say, have not been many. But the size is immense. I mean, the three big ones, uh, Signature, Silicon Valley Bank, and Credit Suisse, they are 
three of the top four bank failures in the history of the earth in terms of size. I think uh, Washington Mutual was number two or number one or something. It depends on how you measure it from a nominal perspective. But only three hit the wall. Well, five have actually hit the wall. But those three biggies uh, are just historical proportion. And th- and we've and there's more to come. There's another 186 to come. And there's banks all over the world uh, suffering right now. I read as well this morning that Sri Lanka just had to get a $3 billion bailout from the IMF. And that shows you this, the global stress in the system. Where's the IMF getting the money? Well, there, that, that's a that's a subject for another debate. <laughs> another time we can go hours on that. Where are they getting the money? Uh, but uh, what you're talking about a bank run, and sure, um, you know, Google Trends says that that term is popular too. People are watching programs like this and thinking to themselves, "Should I withdraw my money?" And you're right. We're, we're we're seeing bank runs. We're seeing people move capital out of the regional banks. The question is, where do they go with that money, James? If I go oh. to my bank and withdraw all my cash, I you know oh. I can keep it under my mattress for only so long before I realize that's not really a viable way to live. Well, we're we're pivoting onto a topic here, which I don't know if it's allowed, but I'll, I'll mention it anyway. So it was Sunday. Um, uh, I get a phone call from a friend of mine that has seven digits on First Republic Bank sitting in a checking account. And he calls me in a panic state. And this person is a non-believer in something called Bitcoin. And he said, how do I get my money out of First Republic today and into Bitcoin today? How does he transfer that? And that's just one of a few cases that weekend. And that's just what I'm hearing. Uh, Also, during this last crisis of the last 10 days, we had the most rapid acceleration of new Bitcoin wallets we've seen. And of course, Bitcoin has gone up 70% in the last 90 days. Extraordinary movement for an asset like that. And the question the people face, like you mentioned, it's a brilliant question. What do you do? Okay, uh, I can't trust the banks. Uh, I can't trust the treasuries because the U.S. government is printing money like crazy, so it's going to debase like crazy. Yeah, I might get 3.5% or 4%, but the purchasing power is falling by 14% in real terms. What am I going to do? Uh, do I put it into the stock market? Well, everybody says we're going into a recession, so the stock market is going to crash. That doesn't sound good. Where, where do I find a hard asset? You know, We saw gold spike above $2,000 for a few hours uh, yesterday, I think it was. Um, and that's an example of exactly what people are seeking out. They want to find that hard, safe harbor for assets where they can deploy cash. And that's why we're seeing you know, Bitcoin as a new asset class really uh, face... <laughs> it's, it's probably uh, witnessing its best marketing campaign ever. And it was built during the last financial crisis. It's designed for financial crises. And that's why it's it's doing so well. So I think a lot of people are saying, okay, you know, even though I may not trust Bitcoin, I better have two to five percent of my cash in it, just in case, just in case everything else goes to hell in the handbasket. So I'm seeing a lot of that happen. I'm gonna give you a few, not many, just maybe two or three extreme bear cases, scenarios, financial conditions, hypotheticals, and I'd like you to evaluate them. These are um, you know, very extreme bearish cases that I've heard. Uh, First, the stock market will not recover for for the next 10 years at least. There's actually a recent precedent for that. Following the dot-com bubble burst in the early 2000s, the Nasdaq didn't recover to its pre-2000 high until 14 years later. This time is the same, people argue. Please evaluate. I've heard that too, uh, a couple of times. um, That, well, first of all, uh, I look at things from a data and math perspective. I, I, don't uh, look at other things or find an anomaly somewhere back in history and say, this is the same. No, it's not. So the money printing will continue. Therefore, currency will debase and that actually inflates markets. No ifs, ands, or buts. Now, second of all, I did mention that 14% a few times. That's typically what the market will do. And third, if you look at the average p e ratio for the S&P 500, it is, I think it's about 18 and historical bottoms hit around 17 or something. So it's not like the market is like it was back during the dot-com era, where it was extremely high. And you know you had traditional companies with 3 to 4% growth per annum trading at PE ratios of 130. 
That didn't make any sense. But you don't have that today. You know, we had back in December, November, there was stocks like Meta trading at a PE of seven. They're still doing, you know, 10, 20% growth. Yeah, they had a bit of a blip and stuff. So uh, there comes a time when things are just really, really cheap. And we're right there. Uh, again, earnings are not as catastrophic as people think. Uh, uh, there has been an inflationary period. That means uh, companies can charge more for their product, therefore make more, more profit. Uh, so yeah, I do not believe in that at all. And we've already seen that so far. We had people saying, um, many people said, oh, there's only going to be one asset class that's going to survive last year and this year. And uh, that hasn't done very well. It's been flat. And the stock market itself this year is up. Uh, late last year, it rallied very, very hard. And now we're currently at that. Let's check the level. Wouldn't surprise me if it's at 4,000 exactly. 39.74. Um, S and P 500. The floor we hit back in October, I think, is around 3,500. Are we going to hit that again? It would take a bit of a black swan for that to happen. And I do believe, uh, if we go back to how the makeup of the stock market, you've got to understand that I believe 60% are zombie companies that won't exist over the next eight years. They'll go out of business. And it's the top 10 companies, though, in the S and P 500 that drive 60% of the gains. And that's where people need to focus, everybody. Not buying an index fund, but focus on the disruption. All right, let's talk about that. So which sectors? I remember back a couple of years ago, right after the pandemic, people were talking about a K-shaped recovery, certain sectors doing very well while others fail. Um, to a certain extent, we've seen that. Now, um, a lot of the companies that did very, very well uh, three years ago, Zoom, for example, have now all but crashed back down to far below pre-COVID levels. Um, your assessment on the sectors that you think will do very well coming out of this crisis, and of course, the other zombie companies that won't do well. Well, it's interesting. If you go back and analyze, like I, I all I do is analyze data and numbers and try to identify trends as a result of that. That's all I do exclusively. I don't listen to sentiment. I don't watch TV or anything like that. Uh, so if you go back to the last 10 years, the top assets, Bitcoin, up 60,000, NVIDIA, 9,000, Tesla, 8,000. And I'm talking percentage points here, 60,000%. So um, NVIDIA, I think 9,000, 8,000 for Tesla, uh, Microsoft. Th th this, is, this is the incredible thing here. And this is why I'm very big into a few names, high conviction. You go from 60,000 uh, percent return on Bitcoin, 9,000 on NVIDIA, 8,000 on Tesla, and then the next winner is Microsoft at 1,000%. It's a 10x over 10 years. And that's the fourth, fifth best performing asset. And that's stunning. And then you go all the way down, gold is flat. Flat over the last 10, 11 years, 12 years, uh, depending on when you look at it. And the S&P 500 over the last 10 years, I think, is up 200%. So the question is, where do you want to be when you've got these big black hole asset classes that absorb all the returns and get the exponential gains. And that's what I believe uh, people should be focusing on. And you're dead right. That K shape, except for the top of the K is 10 names. It's not 250 names. The bottom is 60%. Okay. So let's talk about the theme of innovation. So all those companies that you mentioned that went up 60,000, 9,000 uh, percentage points over the last 10 to 15 years, I would say the common theme is that they're what they were at their time technological innovators. So two part question: Those companies that you just named are they still the leaders in their respective segments in terms of innovation? And if not, second question: Who will take their place? Yeah, and that's what I spend probably twenty to thirty percent of my time doing is identifying uh, using your Canadian analogy where the puck is going to be. What is the big narrative for the next? eight to 10 years. I like to think in five to 10 year periods of time, because the longer the time frame you have, the more accurate you can be, believe it or not, uh, when it comes to the stock market. So um, I've always focused on disruption because that grows the fastest. That has the S curve effect, the exponential gains, the network effect, Metcalf's law, et cetera. So you try to identify something that has that type of disruptive ingredient. And I'm trying to find, is there going to be another Bitcoin or NVIDIA or Tesla as we go forward. So first of all, let's take the theme for the next eight years. It's going to be AI. AI, 
NVIDIA. They make the chips that drive it. You have ChatGBT run by Microsoft. They can't order enough chips fast enough to fuel the demand for this platform in their data centers. You've got Tesla. If they nail AI for FSD, that will explode the value proposition of the company where the return on investment could potentially go to infinity. Um, so they are two that I'm definitely looking at. Uh, in terms of a store of value, uh, look at something that is not very well adopted and at the same time has a lot of value and is extremely hard, i.e. there can't be more of it printed. Uh, that is Bitcoin. You know, two and a half percent of the world have adopted it. 97 and a half percent of the world hate it and they hate it because they don't have it. And, and, and they, they hate it with a vengeance. But after what's just happened right now in the crisis, banking crisis we've had, it really speaks to the narrative of that. Uh, and then there's other names too that are kind of interesting. I do believe in disruption of TradFi. I come from the TradFi background. I know how archaic it is. Uh, I believe blockchain will completely radically disrupt the whole banking industry, the insurance industry, the asset management industry, the way stock markets are run, et cetera. Yeah, um, it is kind of the um, philosophy adopted by a lot of fund managers now, Kathy Wood being a prominent one. How do you know, though, James, how do you know if something is currently disrupting the market? It's easy to say in hindsight, yes, Tesla disrupted the auto market. Um, hindsight, so it's 2020. Living in the moment now, James, how do you know a company is really disrupting? Yeah, it, it's tricky. Uh, for example, I, I was an early investor in things like Google because I had this, uh, I, I believed in search. And I remember talking to a friend at a barbecue. This is way before there was a GPS device and a cell phone or anything like that. But I said, imagine, and Google was just about to IPO. Imagine having search in your mobile device that knew exactly where you are. And it could tell you, okay, I'm looking for a coffee. Boom. It'll pop up. That was that was the vision. So you got to kind of try to identify how technologies can change a whole experience for somebody. Uh, second of all, you have to identify the company or the technology that somebody has and has moats built all around it so the competition can't catch up. And third, if you look at who the competition is of that disruptor, how crap they are and that makes it easier um so that's why you see you know people call tesla a car company it's the furthest thing from a car company yeah they make cars but really they don't they make massive levels of disruption with colliding s curves uh, that's what makes them special nvidia again they own the ai chip which is going to fuel the world going forward and uh, bitcoin is hard so they're kind of like my big three bets going forward right now and of course there's other ancillary bets too but they be the big ones final question and final bear case so we talked about the stock market flatlining which you refuted uh the other thing that i've heard is that the dollar is going to collapse some people have thought that it was you know some people have been thinking this for a long time but now they're making uh new cases for this uh, I'll give you three. This is, this is not necessarily my opinion, but this is the opinion I've heard from a lot of people. Uh, three potential reasons for why the dollar will completely collapse or at least lose its status as the number one de facto currency of the world. Uh, number one is that all fiat currencies throughout history eventually lose all their value. Uh, Rome has fallen. No empire stays alive forever. Number two is that the bifurcation of the world economy, which we briefly talked about offline, is happening now. Uh, the end of the petrol dollar could be happening, and so people are going to be dumping dollars and perhaps using another currency, perhaps a brick uh, basket or perhaps the yuan. And number three, the erosion of the dollar conf or confidence in the dollar, the erosion of the confidence in the dollar is happening now because, like you said, a limited quantitative easing. Why would I trust a currency that is going to be printed to infinity at any given time and and live in a country where there's inflation, right? So these three reasons will cause the collapse of the dollar. What do you think? Well, it's funny. Take the last one first, the printing. All central banks are printing. So it's like a level playing field. So I wouldn't say the dollar will collapse because of printing because everybody's doing the same thing. But the way I look at... Just on that note, just on that note real quick. I mean, you're right. I mean, the DXY, for example, just in the note of the dollar collapsing, it's at the highest level in 20 years. Let's just keep that in mind relative exactly. to other currencies. 
and I used to watch currencies like a hawk uh, for a huge part of my life. And that was was my life. So uh, it, it's fascinating to see what has happened lately. But getting back to your three reasons, I'll counter them with five reasons. And these are the historical five reasons that cause hyperinflation. And I'll tell you if the dollar will hyperinflate. So first, uh, government overprinting money, check. Rapid increase in the money supply, check, tied to government overprinting money. Loss of confidence in the economy. Well, we just lost confidence in the banking industry. Check. And that's a big part of confidence in the economy per se. Uh, four is decrease in the supply of goods and services. Some things are harder to find. You, you know, you have car companies that can't get their hands on chips. Uh, we had supply chain issues with C19, etc. So that could be a kind of a sort of a check, not a full on check. But um, sometimes if you are going to a store looking for certain things, you can no longer get them. So that could drive prices up. Um, fun, fun story. There's a favorite spice of mine that literally you can't get for love and money. And people are selling it for like $100 a container on eBay. And it used to cost six bucks. So that's an example of that. And uh, five is wars and political instability. Check. We don't need to talk more about it. So the question is, these are the five ingredients for hyperinflation. We got them all, more or less. But I don't believe we will hyperinflate. You're dead right, though. Um, the petrodollar is at risk. The U.S. has many enemies when it came to came to sanctions on Russia. It was very clear who friends of the United States were versus friends of Russia, and that was kind of staggering to me. Uh, not getting political, I don't have, uh, as I say, a dog in this fight, but. There are people coming for that. And getting back to kind of confidence in treasuries, there are $9 trillion of U.S. treasuries coming up to be renewed. Who, tell me, who on earth is going to buy those $9 trillion treasuries? The answer is the government's going to have to buy them themselves. So it's kind of weird. It's like robbing Peter to pay Paul. They'll be buying their own treasuries. So the deficits are exploding. There are states in the United States that have huge problems. Uh, you know, they were banking on big returns, like a huge part of tax revenue in many countries around the world is capital gains and stocks. That's not going to exist in the year 2023 when they look back at 2022. Um, the states are just hitting the wall. U.S. deficits are going crazy. I believe that we will see a trillion dollars in interest service payments uh, this year. Uh, for the Fed, and that's 35, 40% more than the defense budget, which is staggering to think of. Again, deficits are exploding, debt will explode, money printing will continue, and there will be a, a high level of debasement of the currency. It'll go from that 14% to about 20, 25%, but it'll be gradual. And that's why I say the next eight years will be extremely important, the most important years of our lives, because there will be a lot of radical disruption radical change, huge debt explosions, which will result in people really seeking out hard assets. That's kind of the closing thought. Well, James, I appreciated all your thoughts today, not just your closing thoughts. Thank you very much for your time. Finally, where can people learn more about you and your work? Uh, just uh, YouTube, Invest Answers, and uh, I'm on Twitter too. Although I use Twitter to be kind of more playful. <laughs> so, uh, but YouTube is where I am at. And by the way, I look forward to having you on my channel real soon. Okay. Look the forward to that, James. Turn. The tables will turn. <laughs> uh, I'm uh, a little bit nervous, but uh, grateful at the same time for you inviting me. Thank you very much for coming on my show today, James. And uh, I'm sure the audience Such appreciates fun. it. Uh, we'll, we'll speak again soon. And good luck with the new channel. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to learn more about how the Federal Reserve is likely going to respond to Credit Suisse being bought out by UBS and to the ongoing financial and banking crisis over the last month, watch my interview with Ted Oakley, founder of Oxbow Advisors. He breaks down how the Federal Reserve is likely going to respond and how the markets will respond this week and next. Watch the interview. I'll put the link down in the description below. Thanks for tuning in and don't forget to subscribe.